Fidelity Digital Assets, they manage $4.5 trillion in assets. They have just written a very bullish report on why they think Ethereum is freaking awesome. They have two different investment theses that they lay out, but there's also a few important details that I want to add on top of that, particularly to do with BlackRock and the potential for Ethereum to be the base layer of, well, all real-world assets coming into the Web3 space. The implications in this situation for the price of Ethereum with everything else accounted for are pretty spectacular. Now, before we talk about that, hit that thumbs up button if you enjoy this kind of content. And of course, subscribe to the channel if you are not subscribed already. So you make sure that the YouTube algorithm will feed you more of these great kind of videos. So the Ethereum investment thesis, Ethereum's potential as digital money and a yield bearing asset. Now, they break it down into two separate theses, but essentially... This is really one thesis. If we're being honest, all this stuff is valid. All this stuff comes together for Ethereum. And this is going to be a high level overview. If you really want to uh, dig into this, then I'll leave a link in the description for this PDF. And you can read through the entire report yourself. So the first investment thesis is Ethereum as aspiring money. And there's a few different interesting things they point out in this conversation here, but just to highlight a few simple ideas, a common narrative theorizes that Bitcoin is best understood as an emerging monetary good, which leads to the question whether Ether can also be considered money as well. The short answer is yes, it can be viewed that way by some. However, Ether will likely face significantly more headwinds than Bitcoin to become widely accepted as a form of money. As shown below, Ether shares many properties of money with Bitcoin and other currencies. However, it differs from Bitcoin in scarcity and track record. Problem is, Ether technically has an unlimited supply parameters, which are kept within a range depending on the number of validators and burn. These parameters, while strictly enforced by the network, are not equivalent to that of a fixed supply schedule and can swing in unexpected directions depending on the underlying components, which is all very true. A digital assets track record not only has to do with time since inception, but also time since ossification. Since Ethereum undergoes network upgrades roughly once every year, the new code needs time, more importantly, developer eyes to rebuild in its performance history. While this concept of code execution being probabilistically guaranteed over time is specific to digital assets, it undoubtedly is important for garnering stakeholder trust. So they're all very, very interesting, and I think very honest points to be honest, on Ethereum as a form of money, Bitcoin does have more history and more history of the code itself being kind of just one way. Upgrades to Bitcoin happen very, very slowly and for good reason. Nobody wants developers messing with their money. And while Ethereum as aspiring money is definitely an interesting conversation to have. And certainly there's a lot of good points to this conversation about Ethereum as money or even just Ethereum as really an investment class asset. You can't argue with the fact that Bitcoin has definitely been doing some pretty awesome stuff over the last years. And it's just it's just so solid. It's so dependable where we've had a lot of a lot of high stakes upgrades for Ethereum that has left some investors with a bit of concern from time to time, whether well-founded or not. So what about Ether as a store of value? Well, for something to be a good store of value, it needs to be scarce or to have a high stock-to-flow ratio. Ether has a stock-to-flow ratio that is higher than Bitcoin as of July 2023. This dynamic has recently taken center stage since the merge, significantly reducing the amount of Ether being issued as shown below. So this is a pretty interesting thing. So obviously Bitcoin's got 21 million Bitcoin that are all they're ever going to be. There's 19.5 million or something like that currently uh, issued out. Four or five million gone forever, lost beneath the waves of time. But what about Ether as a store of value? Again, as they mentioned in the intro here, while we have seen since the merge, the total supply of Ethereum going down, around 300,000 coins are burned in the last year. That is an important metric. However, we must remember that the parameters for Ethereum can change over time. So if we talk about Ethereum as a store of value over 10 or 20 years, 
chances are the parameters are going to work in your favor in a very strong way. That's what I believe personally, but it's an untested theory. It's something that we need to see actually play out in the real world. Because what happens whenever we see massive scalability come to Ethereum? Suddenly, maybe we're not seeing as many fees being burnt because the fees are now so low on chain, there was not a lot of fee burning going on. And so now we start getting inflationary again. And the parameters of the Ethereum supply are less clear than Bitcoin, let's say. Not saying they're bad. I like Ethereum's. Uh, value proposition in terms of its supply and the potential for the supply reduction. But there's something just so beautiful about Bitcoin's 21 million coins, isn't there? What about Ethereum as a means of payment? Ether is used as a means of payment, but these payments have been limited to digitally native assets, aka NFTs and things like that. Ethereum typically reaches finality in 13 minutes for most transactions, making it faster to become a guaranteed settlement than Bitcoin's six block or one hour. Probabilistically, probabilistically, probable uh, guaranteed settlement. F finality in Ethereum means that a transaction has been included in a block that cannot change without a large amount of Ether being slashed. This mechanism makes Ether an attractive payment asset in terms of time to final settlement, but has hurdles to overcome for the payments use case to take off, most of which have to do with user experience and persistently high transfer fees. This is exactly right. If you want to use Ethereum as a means of payment, it's kind of on par in a lot of ways uh, with Bitcoin. They both work great for payments. They work better at layer two. So if you want to make payments using the Ethereum network, you want to use a layer two network like Arbitrum or Optimism or Base whatever else. If you want to make a payment with Bitcoin, you're again, Bitcoin Lightning Network. Now, Bitcoin fees, a dollar or two to send a Bitcoin transaction. Ethereum fees, usually a few bucks to send Ether itself. You want to send a stablecoin payment, maybe four or five bucks. Depends on the time in the network, how much demand there is at the time you're trying to send that. But those kind of fees, even though relatively low, make it prohibitive for smaller transactions to happen. So if you're buying a cup of coffee, you probably don't want to pay using Ethereum, but you could pay using a Layer 2 network. You could pay using Solana, of course, and spend a fraction of a penny. Then there's the idea of valuing Ether based on demand. Because applications on the Ethereum network require Ether, increased adoption of the Ethereum network could lead to increased price of Ether and value accrual to the Ether token holders due to supply and demand mechanics. Additionally, investors should consider revisiting demand side models as Ethereum scaling progresses, judging where new users are coming from and the use cases they seek may help investors determine where the trends of value accrual could be heading. So that's very interesting. Of course, we are seeing layer twos take off in a very serious way. And look, a lot of this stuff is things we've all talked about before here on the channel. The burn rate for Ethereum, uh, the Ethereum going into the staking contract, which they don't really go into here, but that's, I think, a big deal as well, because we've seen 28 million Ether go into the staking contract, which is now locked up for two plus years. That's something that will change over time, but still is a very interesting factor to bring in here. But really, what do you need to see the value of Ether really go up long term? And that's more damn demand for the ETH asset. And actually, all of these Layer 2 networks really, really do well in providing that. The more success Arbitrum has, the more success Ethereum is going to have. The more success Optimism has, the more success Ethereum is going to have. The more success that Base has, and on and on and on, and ZK Sync and all the other Layer 2s that are coming out, this is all good for Ethereum. Because that creates more demand for the ETH asset. And when all of these Layer 2s are using huge amounts of ETH in terms of lots of people doing transactions and lots of people you know, putting into liquid staking contracts and all these kind of things, it creates more demand for the asset as more users come in for the Ethereum network. Now, before we get into part two of their investment thesis, which is a bit of a smaller part, and of course, the BlackRock stuff, if you are a cryptocurrency investor, you got to get yourself signed up to the Wealth Mastery Investor Report. It is the best damn newsletter in the cryptocurrency industry. Every single week, we'll get this three times to your inbox. We talk about 
altcoins. We talk about the latest news affecting the markets. We talk about NFTs and DeFi and airdrops and much, much more. You can join our 75,000 weekly readers and sign up for free using the link in the description. So check it out. Now, investment thesis part two, Ethereum as a yield bearing asset. Of course, Ethereum staking currently around three and a half to four percent, depending on how you're staking it. A lot of people are using liquid staking providers like Lido Finance or Rocket Pool. That's fine. They take a little fee. You still get a pretty good yield in return, a lot easier than uh, running your own node. So I understand people are definitely doing that. But Ethereum as a yield bearing asset. See, this is a very interesting proposition because if you look at Ethereum as sort of the ultimate crypto bond, it becomes a very interesting idea because when you buy and stake Ethereum, you are essentially getting access to a huge portion of the entire cryptocurrency industry. You're getting access to stable coins. You're getting access to NFTs. You're getting access to gaming. You're getting access to layer two networks. You're getting access to cross-chain stuff happening, uh, wrapped assets, wrapped real world assets, all these kinds of different things that are happening on chain. If you're bullish on any and all of that stuff, just buy and stake Ethereum because Ethereum right now, so far, could change in the future, but so far has been the center point for all of that stuff happening in the entire cryptocurrency space. Bitcoin's digital gold. Ethereum is like everything else happening. And yeah, there's competitors like Solana coming up trying to stake their claim on a part of that piece of pie too. But right now, Ethereum is super far ahead of any of the competitors in a variety of ways, from their layer two networks to the institutional adoption, so on and so forth. The, just the mind share on Ethereum is absolutely incredible. So Ethereum as a yield bearing asset, I think that is something that is definitely going to speak to a certain crowd of investors, especially with this. So this is um, Kathy Wood's ARK Invest. They have filed for a spot Ethereum ETF. A few other companies have now joined them. It's now at the time of recording. There's three spot Ethereum ETFs out there being pursued in the market. People want to get that spot ETH ETF out there for people. And of course, if those ETFs can offer dividend yields in the form of staking rewards, bada bing, bada boom, baby. We now have a massive institutional asset class in terms of potential demand where we could see billions of dollars flooding into Ethereum staking, trying to get their hands on access to all that stuff I just mentioned. This is if you want to invest in Web3, just buy and stake Ethereum or buy an Ethereum spot ETF that has staking rewards. Those will give you that, that gives you that access, that broad market exposure to all these things happening in crypto. And of course, it's only a matter of time before BlackRock brings in their own Ethereum spot ETF application. It is going to happen. Hear me now, quote me later, BlackRock is coming to Ethereum in a big way, if only in part beyond, of course, getting their Ethereum spot ETF, which I'm sure they'll do shortly after the Bitcoin ETF is approved, but also when it comes to to tokenization because Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, has talked about how basically everything is going to be tokenized. Everything will be tokenized at some point. That means these big institutional players, remember JP Morgan works with the Ethereum guys. A lot of the top banks in the world are working with Ethereum. We're seeing Ethereum Layer 2 is taking off. Chainlinks CCIP is being worked with by the two quadrillion dollar DTTC clearinghouse and SWIFT, which basically handles like all international payments for like all interbank communications. Big stuff is happening here and chain lap chain link. Ethereum already has all the infrastructure in place for all of this stuff to happen. And a lot of the experimentations, the early pilot programs are happening on Ethereum. So will we see BlackRock tokenizing real estate and bonds and equities and stuff like that on top of Ethereum, I think there's a pretty good chance that we will. Not to say they won't use other blockchains too, but I think stop number one will be Ethereum. And what does that do to the price of Ether with all this stuff we've just talked about? I don't know. But my guess is that it has upward price potential, let's say. Okay, 
Let me know what you think about all this down below in the comment section. I'll see you next time.